Good morning or good afternoon. Um, we are back this afternoon with a documentary film panel. Um, I thank you all for tuning in and continuing to tune in and hopefully you'll do so throughout the week. Um, I am Emily Williams, the co-chair for the Natchez Literary and Cinema Celebration. And I'm going to get started. We're going to get started today. I'm just going to go through and introduce very quickly our four film experts, and then I'm going to let them take it away. Um, I do want to encourage you, if you have questions, please ask those throughout, um, and we'll take them as we can. Um, if it's a question for any of our um, panelists, just, you know, type your question. If you want it to be for a specific person, please note that. Um, first, I'd like to introduce Mark LaFrancis. Mark, if you'll give a little wave. Um, Mark is a Natchez local. He has worked on numerous oral history film projects, is the author of nine books, and the founder and president of the Home with Heroes Foundation, which is a nonprofit dedicated to helping veterans. Melanie Addington, if you'll give us a little wave. Okay. Um, Melanie has worked with the Oxford Film Festival since 2006 in various capacities and became the executive director in 2015. She also directs, writes, and produces films and serves on the Mississippi Film Alliance as president. She co-founded Ox Film, the Yaknapatafa Arts Council's program to lend equipment to the Oxford filmmakers. Tried to get that pronunciation. You did it, you did it perfect. Thank you. <laughs> um, next we have Keith Beecham. If you'll give us a little wave, Keith. All right. Keith is an award-winning producer, director, and host of numerous films and documentaries that have been featured on prominent networks such as ABC, MSNBC, CNN, BBC, and the BET. He has been published in the New York Times, Washington Post, USA Today, Associated Press, and Chicago Times. He is also a frequent lecturer at colleges and universities around the country. Welcome, Keith. And next we have James William Therese. James, all right. James is an award-winning executive writer for the Department of Veteran Affairs in Washington, D.C., and an award-winning independent documentary filmmaker. His three films, The 30th of May, The Hello Girls, and the internationally known film 6888 have all received a number of prestigious awards. So this is our film panel today. Welcome everyone. And um, I'm gonna turn it over to Mark and let y'all proceed to uh, discuss. And again, in case anybody's just tuning in, if you have questions, please leave them in the comments. We will monitor that. If it's for a specific person, just let us know. All right. Great, I'm Mark LaFrancis, as uh, Emily said. Uh, my first question, and I'm gonna ask the, the panelists about the same kind of questions uh, with uh, Melanie, it's a little different, uh, but she has been involved in seeing so many films, documentaries, and interacting with dozens of documentary filmmakers. So she's kind of a, a, a documentary filmmaker uh, aficionado, I'll put it that way. <laughs> uh, but I wanted to ask uh, Keith, because we were talking about this before we came on, uh, what the heck got you started in making a documentary? Well, Mark, thank you for the question. Thank you everyone for having me. Um, but before I begin, I have to pay homage to um, my mentor, my leader, my Confidant, my teacher, the late Mrs. Mamie Till Mobley, the mother of Emmett Till. Uh, for I believe if not for the murder of her son Emmett Till, there would not be a Keith Beauchamp filmmaker today. And so I, I have to pay homage to her for introducing me into this activism that I've learned over the years and of course find myself being in the middle of. Um, but my journey um, as a documentarian filmmaker, um, I think I said before we came on, I didn't go out and search for it. it. It came to me. And it came by way of the story of Emmett Till, um, who I had learned about at the age of 10. I grew up in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and I came across a Jet Magazine photograph of Emmett Till 
Um, many of us who saw that photograph understand when I opened up this magazine, I saw this photograph of this young boy and I was shocked. And it was at that time my parents told me the story of Emmett Till, but throughout my life, the name kept resurfacing. When I got into high school, I was interracially dating. The first thing my parents would tell me before I left the house at night was don't let what happened to Emmett Till happen to you. So it became an educational tool to teach me about the racism that still exists in this country today. But it wasn't until two weeks before my high school graduation where I had my real run in with racism when I was actually assaulted by an undercover police officer for dancing with a white classmate of mine. And that's what spurred me into wanting to fight injustice. And I felt the only way that could be possible if I became a part of that system. So I began to study criminal justice at Southern University of Baton Rouge in hopes of becoming a civil rights attorney. But then my junior year, I was introduced to filmmaking by childhood friends who had moved to New York City and started their own film production company. So it was at a company meeting one evening that I was asked if there was something that I would want to produce as a feature film, what it would it be? First thing that came to mind was the story that I heard most of my life and met Till. So I, you know, I, I envy everyone on this panel. But I have to say to you that um, you know, this is, was, wasn't something that I was seeking out. I wanted to be a civil rights attorney. But I eventually, you know, when I had the opportunity to tell the story of Till, I wanted to tell it as a feature film first and ended up writing a screenplay that was optioned off by producers who worked with Showtime and they sat on the project. So I didn't have any kind of control. And it's because of that reason I was encouraged by the late Mrs. Mamie Till Mobley to produce a documentary that would be used as a stepping stone to get her son's case reopened and as well as stepping stone for myself to produce the feature film later on. And so in 2004, finally our dreams were answered when my film um, was the behind, I should say, of the opening, the reopening of the Emmett Till murder case nearly 50 years later. And that's what made me uh, who I am today. And I try to stay consistent with the work. And as you probably know, um, as your viewers probably know, you've probably seen my face around a lot of different places. Emmett Till was my first film. Um, that was 18 films ago. And so, um, but I always like to revisit this moment in my life because it really um, showed me the power that one could possess with the tools of the trade. So filmmaking to me, and especially documentary filmmaking, so important, um, it is my activism tool. And so, and this is why I'm with you this afternoon. Thank you. Great, thank All you right. very much, Keith. And I think I think that uh, is, uh, as they say in the uh, media world, uh, a wonderful segue uh, to James, because uh, James, through his work, just like Keith, has become an activist, and has had uh, some pretty uh, significant accomplishments as well. And I'm gonna let James jump in there. How did you get started? And tell us some of the, 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 the journey of your making films. Sure, can everyone hear me? Yes. Okay, so uh, I started by accident, kind of like uh, Keith a little bit. I was doing my graduate work at Jackson State University. There's the shirt right there. And um, I, my graduate paper came across this story in Natchez, Mississippi uh, um, about African-American who have ce celebrated uh, Memorial Day since 1866. And generation, 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 both sides of the river got together on Memorial Day and marched, had a, you know, think of a New Orleans style uh, uh, march and it was really cool, you know, young folks, they, they've kind of rebranded it down to every generation. So um, that, uh, let me grab this here. So that's kind of, can anyone see that okay? Yeah. So that was, uh, so what's significant about that shot there is that up until 1940, that bridge wasn't there. So folks were so dedicated to, to, to uh, celebrate black military service to the country. That's how it evolved. Uh, that they would ferry across the river mm -hmm. from Vidalia, Louisiana to Natchez and then meet there. So then when the bridge was built, 
folks started marching over the bridge and I go, you know, I, I got to reach back out because I think COVID might have interrupted that speech or not speech that, uh, that March since, yes, since they, it since did. They, so it did, which is a sad thing because, uh, they had a consecutive streak of over 150 years of marching to the national cemetery on the Hill. So, uh, I got, so I got, I made that film because I was doing graduate work at Jackson State and I came across this, this story and I had written a paper and I, and I was just going to turn it, I, I wanted to, I wanted to uh, um, film it, but, and I was just going to turn in the raw footage and be done with it. Well, then I, I, the guy I knew that helped me film, I said, well, let's, let's goof around and turn it into a movie. And a documentary. Well, the doggone thing ended up on Mississippi Public Television, which was mm -hmm. cool. So that led me to the next one, uh, which kind of found me. And so, and the things that I do, my my three films are uh, documentaries are about um, uh, mil you know, veterans and military. Mm -hmm. So, the 30th of May was was veterans celebrating black, black military, military service, and then uh, the Hello Girls was a uh, documentary that was, I did it on the 100th anniversary of the end of World War One, And I ended up even being in, um, I ended, oh, this says musical, but here's the Hello Girls. That was my documentary. And you're looking at one of 10 people that, that ended up uh, in Chaumont, France, General Pershing's headquarters, where we had lunch with the locals and then went to a, a uh, 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 a big theater, sold out theater, 500 people. Uh, so I, I had done the Hello Girls. I was traveling the country and someone kept telling me, have you heard about these, these black women that served during World War II? And I had not. And people are all, like you guys know, people are always coming up to us, right? And saying, hey, I got this great story for you. <laughs> and, you, you know, you got like, oh, okay, cool. So by the third time I had heard about these, the, this black uh, postal unit, Central, Central Postal Directory unit, they were, they were a male unit in uniform serving overseas during World War II in Birmingham, England, and Rouen, France. So by the t third time that I heard that, they said, oh, you know, you should hear about this story. I looked into it and there was a lot of, uh, there was a lot online about them. There's, there's 6888 there. That's what I call a famous photo of Charity Adams inspecting her troops. Well, by the time I ended up uh, kind of finishing the Hello Girls going around to, to the country and overseas. And the third time I heard about 6888, I said, oh, this must be something. Looked it up and I saw there was eight or nine women still alive, uh, World War II women, whose three have since since passed just, you know, in the last six months, which is sad. But so so I decided to do that film. And what the, the last two films, which is, which is interesting, both ended up by Congress submitting them for the Congressional Gold Medal, which is the highest civilian award uh, in the country. First, the first person that got that was George Washington. That's how old that is. So... Um, there's new legislation now for the, for the, what we call the six triple eight. And, uh, we hope that they'll get, uh, one of the highest awards, civilian awards in the country. Um, and there's about, there's eight women still alive now. Um, so that it's, that's, what's interesting to me, military history and, uh, and focus because, and focus more on, um, uh, women, uh, veterans and, and minority veterans. Because those are the stories that have not been told. Whereas, so, so I, you know, I, my kind of motto for, for my company is, you know, uh, do, doing films in the nooks and crannies of history. And so that's, that's what has happened. So I came to it by accident and in 2016, and uh, I've been doing it ever since. I love it. That's me. Sorry. Wonderful. Wonderful. Yeah. And, uh, uh, is there anything that the uh, uh, viewers can do uh, for both Keith and, and James uh, to help uh, with the causes now that you have adopted? In other words, Keith, uh, there's, uh, I know, an effort to try to uh, have the uh, Emmett Till uh, case still be investigated and finally resolved. Uh, yes. Could you tell, tell us about that? 
Thank you, thank you, Mark, for that question. Yes, um, as I mentioned earlier, the untold story of Emmett Lewis Till was the impetus to the reopening of the case in 2004. And during that time, um, the case went to a grand jury in 2007 after the investigation of 2004 from the FBI. And um, a grand jury made a decision not to indict the remaining perpetrators who were involved with the kidnapping and murder. And those people were Carolyn Bryant Dunham, the white woman in Mathilde whistled that, as well as Henry Lee Loggins, one of the black men who we believe was forced to participate. Um, in 2017, a book released by Dr. Tim Tyson uh, was published. And um, it was said that in this book, Carolyn Bryant Dunham um, confessed to fabricating, fabricating her story in 1955 during the trial. And as soon as that took place, um, the first thing I did was go to the DA uh, with Mr. Simeon Wright, the cousin of Emmett Till, who shared the bed with him when he, was, when he was abducted that evening. And I asked them to actually reopen the case again. And they did um, in February 2017. Now we're in uh, February 2021. And still we haven't gotten an answer on what type of decision is gonna be made in this case. And so there's this continuous fight um, to get justice for Emmett Till. And it's an interesting take because it's sort of a 360 degree thing for me. I mean, my life has come in full circle. Um, it was you know, early in the 2000s where I'm fighting to get the case reopened and my film wasn't even done yet. And, the case reopened in 2004 and I had to really navigate around the investigation and release my film. And I'm doing the same now with the feature film, navigating around the investigation. But um, I say all this to say is that um, it's very important that we do not forget those who paved the way for us to exist in this free society. And that's why documentary filmmaking is so important to me and, and, and so powerful because it's something that we have control over. Um, it's something, you know, the energy put behind it is something that you could visually show the world because it was that visual of Emmett Lewis Till as a child that I saw that inspired me. And now being able to translate that into the technology and use filmmaking as that platform to share that experience or to show that experience, um, it means the world to me. And so um, I'm asking everyone to please follow, uh, to follow me on all social media platforms. There's a petition that's going around that we're getting everyone to sign. And just you know, help join the family because um, unfortunately, <laughs> the players who were interviewed for my documentary, many of them have passed on, you know, and, and I'm in the midst of now um, actually, um, we're, we're preserving the film because of that reason. And so there's some things that are, that are up and coming that I wish um, soon share, but things that I feel that um, are important, not just um, for the public, but as a filmmaker for myself to produce a film that's going to stand the test of time and that's going to educate and inspire. I mean, that's what it's all about, the work that I do. All right, and uh, for the people who are uh, tuned in or will tune in, um, it's the untold story of Emmett Till. Uh, where can people see it? Well, I, actually, it's on YouTube. I I, um, I control my film, and so okay. this is, you know, it's a blessing to be able to produce something like this and um, share it to the world. It's not never was my personal film. It's it's a a film for everyone, and so mm -hmm. you can. Find it on um, um, YouTube, it was on Amazon. I just took it down because I, I'm getting ready to do a re-release of the film, my director's cut. Okay. And oh, so, good. Uh, yeah, because there's a lot of information that I was not able to put in at the time as a, a fearing that I would hurt the investigation. And okay. so we have an opportunity to, to bring this film back to the world. And James, uh, three films, 30th of May, uh, Hello Girls, Six triple eight. Can people see those? Um, yeah, well, on my website, um, there, and I have them for sale. LincolnPennyFilms.com is my uh, website, and uh, 
uh, available. I, I'm very surprised, folks. How many, as a result, there was a there was a big uh, uh, there was the the, the American Legion, uh, the, the six triple eight. The women were on the cover uh, this this February and had a three three part story. Well, that generated so much. But throughout the time, all the three films, I'm so surprised how many people are still buying DVDs. I mean, so I got DVD. I, I was offered a link. And they're like, no, no, send me the DVD. So um, I've probably sold close to 500 DVDs of all three films already. And I'm, I'm just very surprised. So LincolnPennyFilms.com is where uh, all three films exist. Okay, that's Lincoln like the president? Lincoln like the president, yes. Okay, great. Melody, I'd I like you to jump in here. Uh, you, you've listened to these two, and I'll tell you a little bit about my story in, in, in a short bit. Uh, but... Uh, is there a story similar to other documentarians' stories that you've experienced? Um, yeah, I mean, it's a wide variety. As a female documentary filmmaker, um, I started a narrative, and the, the funding, the channels, the access is harder in narrative. Um, documentary is a way a lot of us, um, men of color, women of all colors, <laughs> uh, really get our foot in the door. Um, and so we see that a lot. Um, oddly, on the film festival circuit, most people start with a narrative short instead of a documentary short, um, which is always surprising because there's so many great stories that don't need an hour and a half that would be told beautifully in 20 minutes and need to be captured. So I'm always surprised how few documentary shorts are out there. Um, but I feel like everybody's story is a little bit different. And one thing I learned living in the South and um, being from both sides of my family, being from the South, but I'm from California originally, that there's a lot of stories I can't tell, but I can support others. Um, so I took a big step back and I really am just trying to help others by finding funding and getting the word out about their films. And um, yeah, it's... I wish there was one answer to how to be a documentary filmmaker, but it's usually pick up a camera <laughs> and start. <laughs> uh, all right, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about uh, my uh, jumping in. Uh, it was uh, almost out of academic necessity at Kapilik Community College where I was director of public information. Uh, the Dean and I were talking uh, and uh, Dr. Nettles said, hey, we need another uh, arts elective. We didn't have enough. And we, the enrollment was going like growing like crazy. So we needed to get more electives for the students to be able to get their credit. So we said, Mark, um, look something up. And I saw on the list of um, uh, classes that there was this introduction to broadcasting and film. And I said, we can offer that. And so <laughs> the, uh, I figured you get somebody else to do it, you see. Uh, he said, so uh, what do you know, you, can you teach it? And I've always been one of those, you know, you say yes and you figure out how to do it later. And I said, sure, I can teach it. Well, first off, we didn't have any cameras. We didn't have any software. We didn't have any students. And he didn't have any money. So other than that, it was, it was going to be a success right off the bat. That so does I, sound like every documentary film start, though. <laughs> so, uh, over the summer, because it was a fall offering, I learned, first off, software. I think I got the first version, uh, version of Adobe Premiere Pro. I think it was 2.1, 2.0 or something like that. And I learned how to do that. Uh, also, I twisted the arms of a couple of folks in town to buy us some cameras. And then I basically watched as many documentaries as I could and films as I could, dissecting them and saying, okay, what are these components? And then when the first class came, well, I thought I was pretty prepared, but we, we started with tiny film, you know, 30 seconds, 15 seconds, as you were mentioning, Melanie, shorts, because the software could handle that and the class could do it. So we made a lot of shorts over the, make a lot uh, short of it. Over 15 years, we produced, I would say 40, 40 films. And they won quite a few state awards in the academic realm. I was retiring, so I decided I needed to continue this filmmaking. 
and created the uh, my film company, New Dawn Video Productions. With the as uh, you know, uh, we mentioned that there's a theme for filmmaking companies. James, you mentioned yours. Ours is New Dawn Video Productions. Uh, films with a purpose, and I knew I didn't want to make do wedding films or other things like that. I wanted to create something that made it made a real difference. And like uh, Keith said, uh, by happenstance, I was at a church service in Natchez, a Beulah Baptist church. And the theme, it was the Natchez Literary and Cinema Celebration back then, 2014. And the theme was civil rights. And there were three speakers at that church service. And they talked about <laughs> how they were taken to the state prison illegally in 1965. Well, the hair stood up on my arms and I said, wait a minute, <laughs> really? And I went up to them and I asked them, I said, how many people actually were taken to the state penitentiary? And they said about 150. A hunt, and they were all like ages 13 to 21. So they were young people, not the old, um, like freedom writers were mostly older people, but these were kids and they were taken from the church, several churches to be taught a lesson back then. They were first brought to the city auditorium, which is a picture behind me, where there were about 800 of them that were warehoused for hours and hours and hours. Some were sent to local jails, some were sent home. The 150 that were left over were taken, forced to go to the Mississippi State Penitentiary in Parchman, the most miserable, horrible institution. It was, they were punished, abused, and humiliated for days. Came back home, there was nothing done about them. No news story, no apology, no welcome home, nothing. For 50 years, this happened. And that day, 50 years almost, was when I went to that church and heard their story and decided this was, as Keith mentioned, the story comes to you. This story came and I said, we have got to do something created an oral history project, produced a film, it took about two and a half years to do. So folks out there are viewing, but folks aren't like instant coffee. <laughs> They're slow brew and produced the film, which has won uh, several awards, which I'm happy about. But also we were able to get the city to apologize to them. And in addition to the apology, the city decided that they would create a commission to create this proud to take a stand monument that now exists outside the very same auditorium where they were taken before they went to Parchment. There's a lot more happening with that Parchment ordeal, the untold story. You can look up on Facebook, you could, there's a website as well. And then we were contracted to do a book about the whole episode and that book is out too. People can learn more about it at Parchment, uh, the Parchment Ordeal, the Untold Story, www.parchmentordeal.org, or Facebook, the Parchment Ordeal. Uh, we decided that the women who went to Parchment were among a select group of people who were courageous and brave in the face of untold terrors growing up as girls and young women. So we're doing a companion story uh, video uh, that's called Women of the Struggle, uh, Facing Fear in the Civil Rights Era, which was gonna be out about this time last year, but COVID hit. So we've had to put our film kind of uh, on the back burner. But films with a purpose, as Keith was telling you, as James was telling you, uh, make the people that were the, who, their, it's their stories. We're making, helping make the people realize that somebody cares. Documentaries can really, really do that because
stereo documentaries. Uh, in a little bit, uh, if we have time, uh, I'll, I'll ask uh, Emily. If we do have time. I have a four minute piece that, that show you, but I'd like to get into uh, a couple of uh, more issues. Um, what have you learned? Uh, this is for everybody. What have you learned that you could tell people who are watching about what they can do to learn about documentaries and begin the process of them. Um, I'll, I'll, I can start. Um, sure. There's two things. Um, not every story has to be told by you. Uh, I think that's important to find collaborators that understand if you're, especially if you're going into community that's not yours. Um, and the ethics of documentary filmmaking. I've been dealing with a documentary feature the past, I don't know, seven years now about a bipolar subject and that brings a lot of different levels of responsibility on what we should put on, you know, the screen about him. Um, but also you don't have to wait to find a ton of money and a producer and the studio system, just pick up your cell phone, capture that person that's 102 years old and has that amazing story. It's so important because most of the media today is corporate owned and there's really only like six companies deciding what stories are important nationally but there's so many more stories than that, um, both in the past and in the present. I can't wait to see all the films that come out from this summer. Um, that's it. Eighth? Well, I, I agree with Melanie. I echo her sentiments. Um, you know, many believe that documentary filmmaking is a difficult road to take. Um, they believe it's difficult to produce a documentary, and it is, I, I'm not gonna lie, but it is. Um, most of the time, um, we're fighting to get capital or to get funding to produce these films. But the greatest thing now is that each year that passes, technology makes it easy for all of us to somewhat tell our stories in a recorded type of way, right? Being a filmmaker and, and, and so on. So just understand, I think the most important element, if you want to do this work, you must know how to tell a story. Simple as play. Um, I say that because if you look at the untold story of Emmett Lewis Till, that wasn't the best shot film ever made. You know, I, I tell you because I shot most of it myself mm -hmm. and it was me with a, a, a DV cam, Sony DV camera running to these people homes and talking with them and convincing them to give me an interview on the spot. And, you know, while I was capturing these interviews, I realized that a lot of the witnesses that I was interviewing at that moment had never spoke publicly to before to anyone. And therefore I realized, I, I kind of thought about, I should say I thought about, it came to me that I was actually capturing depositions and not interviews. And I would take the, this material home to show Mother Mobley and Matilda's mother. And then I would take that information to develop a script. But as I said earlier, when my screenplay was optioned off, I had no control over it, but I did have all these tapes. And that was with the encouragement of Mother Mobley, I decided to gather this information, the tapes, and put it in documentary form. And so I wanna be clear about this. If you have passion to tell the story of someone and if you feel that, you know, in your heart of hearts, you want to tackle this medium of filmmaking or documentary filmmaking, just do it. But you have to know how to tell a story. I didn't have the money early on. It wasn't until my parents thought I was losing my mind <laughs> where they, <laughs> they ended up giving me um, the financing to produce my film. And it was funds that I was supposed to go to law school with. So by that time, when they gave me this, these fund, this funding, I had no choice but to complete what I started. <laughs> you know, uh, so it's it's a funny story now, but um, in the midst of of being having so much passion for something, and my parents told me they never saw me have so much passion to tell a story in my life or to do this type of work. They couldn't help but support me, and I'm glad that I had parents who who allowed me to figure things out myself to help me grow and supported me with my dream. And of course, um, now I have the best of both worlds because I've been able to produce this wonderful film. 
uh, which had put me in a relationship with the FBI and Justice Department to investigate other unsolved civil rights murder cases, which also helped me create television series um, that had never been seen before because there's never been a relationship between the FBI and a filmmaker like our relationship was. Um, well, still is, I should say. But, um, you know, it's when I talk about this, let me just be clear to everyone. It hits home to me as an emotional, um, you know, it hits me emotional. And that is because I never once in a million years thought I would have power to cause change. And documentary filmmaking allowed me to do that. And so I don't have to have the biggest voice in the room. I don't have to have a platform to speak off a podium um, to the world or to be seen in the spotlight. I do my work behind the scenes, you know, in documenting filmmaking. Mm -hmm. And that's, um, I guess that's the best gift I could ever be given. I'm so thankful to be able to live in this world, regardless of the pitfalls. But this is, the, this is what makes me tick. And this is what the way I tell my stories and make impact. Um, can I can I add one thing real fast? Sure. Super important to watch the documentaries that came before you. There's a documentary language. There are three act structures. There are five act structures. There's lots of books you can read, but watching other documentaries is an absolute first step. Um, and before we get to James, uh, I will share with uh, Emily uh, a couple of links uh, for people who are uh, watching and about uh, a really good video I saw on how to make a documentary. And it breaks it down pretty, pretty neat. And, and, and the fellas, pretty, pretty simple, uh, but fun. It's a fun piece. And then another link to uh, a film that I, a documentary film, it's about eight minutes. It's from Australia. It's about a World War II veteran. And it is a phenomenal documentary. And just watching it, you don't even realize you're watching it because it goes by so fast and you become part of that. What it's a one man subject and you can take a one person subject and create a deep emotional yeah. film. And this, when you get the links, go watch that, but also go watch the, the films you're hearing about too, uh, because they are good examples of, of filmmaking. James, um, uh, this, the same kind of question uh, is, uh, you know, the inspiration you got and how you feel that it's, uh, I would even say changed your life. You know, uh, Keith has already said, how important that this the story of Emmett Till is is part of his heart and soul now for you, James. Yeah, uh, thanks. So, so first of all, I agree with uh, the first two folks, um, <clears throat> and um, the second thing is is that I want everyone to know that I was never trained in filmmaking. I always say I'm a historian first, and then if, and, and the, the way I tell stories is through documentaries. Um, it took me, the three films that I did all took me, all were average about seven months. So when I get onto a story, I get it done. Um, and a lot of it uh, is because of, there, there's, you know, there's subjects, for example, the women of the six triple eight, the black women, they're, not, they're between 96 and 100. I can't wait till three months later to interview them. Uh, I gotta do it right away. So um, what I like to do with documentaries, I think this helps if you do it from a historical perspective, is that I look for big anniversary dates to tell little stories or to tell small stories. So like the Hello Girls, I targeted that to be released uh, in 20, 2018, which was the 100th anniversary of when these women, the Hello Girls, the World War I women got their uh, recognition. So they never had recognition. In fact, when they came home from the war, the army said, no, you weren't really soldiers. So they had to fight for 60 years through Congress, through advocates to get their uh, 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 recognition, which they finally did six, you know, 1977, 60 years later. But here we are, um, you know, most were dead, right? There was, there was only uh, 20 or so alive 
by by that time. Same thing with the women of six triple eight, is that um, I forget who mentioned it, but these stories kind of these these two stories, anyways, kind of sought me out. Uh, people were, and I always say to myself, how is it that I got so lucky to be able to tell this story? And um, so I'm real proud of that. I'm happy that, and especially, and I always talk, this may sound a little strange, a little goofy, but what, what I told my producers for, bo for both films is this, we will have success if we keep the women out front of us. We are not the story. The women are the story. And so what has become true with both of these films is the women, the ones that have dece are deceased, and if you and for six for Blake still alive, but the women, they have guided us. There's, they've done certain little things that, like for example, for the Hello Girls, I was told folks, the women waited 100 years to have their story told. So, and then they wanted told. Same thing, the six triple eight women, they were 75 years to have their story told. So, I think the thing is too, if you want to do documentary films. Be you know, be ready right when always always have always be ready to tell that story um, because you never know where it's going to come from. And so, I'm a guy that didn't start documentary filmmaking until I was 52 years old. I mean, come on, anyone can do it if I can do it. So that's uh, that that's that that's my advice is, is uh, always keep keep your eye out for that story that you want to tell and throw your passion into it. Uh, and Emily. Uh, How we do, uh, go sorry. ahead, Melanie. I was just going to say, if I could go in a totally different direction, because we've really focused on social justice, which is such a critical, important part of documentary. But one of my most favorite documentaries I ever made was a three minute short about pie in a little restaurant in Arkansas. And it was just about joy. And sometimes reminding people that there's joy in the South is as important. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, Emily, how are we doing for time? Can we keep rolling? Oops, you're muted. I tried to unmute, sorry. We can keep going for maybe another 10 minutes to allow for, I know I have at least one question waiting. Um, so yeah, just if we wanna touch one other subject, that would probably be perfect. And then we'll get to the question. Okay, um, let's see. We, we already talked about film school, uh, money. Uh, because you know, uh, cameras cost, uh, etc. Uh, what do you uh, each of you suggest as far as uh, money? Do, did you self fund? Did you uh, ask for grants? I know Melanie. I'm going to have you jump in here probably right away because you know money sources. Yeah, um, it depends on the film, um, the and the subject. But you know, the humanities council, the historical councils in your state, your arts councils, they all usually have some sort of film grant. Um, in Mississippi, we have the Mississippi Film Alliance, where we do a, a small micro grant every summer for four projects, um, which is $2,500. But you can match it with your volunteering crew. Um, you don't have to have any other money for it. So it's really good as a good starting point. Um, and then, of course, there's national resources. Um, there's different resources for female filmmakers, uh, like Chicken and Egg Pictures is fantastic. Um, there's the IDA, International Documentary Association, which has lots of resources, film independent. I mean, I could probably go on for an hour on that, but um, mm -hmm. there's a lot of resources. But you can also crowdfund. Um, there's lots of great resources. I love Seed and Spark personally because they really try and help you set you up for success. Uh, and they focus on a lot of equity and making sure that you're, you know, doing the right thing from the beginning. Um, you can always beg your family and friends, but they will get sick after the second or third film. So coming up with a better plan <laughs> is ideal. Uh huh. Keith, how about you? Money. Well, I mean, you know, again, it's it's a difficult road. You you have to go out and, and find money the best way you can, whether it's from your parents like I did, you know, or you go out and, and, and you look for finding sources in which Melody mentioned a slew of um, grantors who are out there in the organization that gives to this type of work. I do have to say that um, the paradigm has changed over the years. It seems to be, to me, it's more difficult in getting money for a civil rights project. 
-hmm. And that's been an ongoing frustration for me throughout my whole career, which is why I went to television at one time and, and began producing my documentaries and stuff for shows like The Injustice Files, which I'm known for, um, which was on Investigation Discovery. And so, you know, it's, un it's, it's I, have, I have to say, it's still a frustrating process, but I do not want those who want to get involved in this work to use that as a deterrent from you producing a film. Um, I don't think there's a wrong or right way of getting money. I think you get money the best way you can. Um, you know, I'm old school, so, you know, the first thing I did was took my credit cards and put them all up. I'm not advising people to do that, let me be clear. <laughs> but that's what I had to do to tell the, my story that I wanted to tell. And, of course, when I got to television, made things a lot easier because I had a number of television series and I already had the money there. And so I missed that world in a sense, but it handicaps you. Um, because you know the money is there and you're not doing it as much for passion as you would if, it, if you didn't have the money and you had to search for it. So now I'm back in the indie world because I need that kick again. I need to feel that struggle that I was feeling from day one, from my early beginnings, that made me the filmmaker that I have become. And so okay. I, I hope that answer is helpful. I don't want you to be discouraged, but... This is the realism of, of becoming filmmakers, you know, in this world and it, the time and, and, and going through this process have a way of weaving out those <laughs> who are not built for the job. <laughs> you, you, you can probably tell documentary filmmakers from uh, very successful feature filmmakers because of the way they dress. <laughs> the documentary filmmakers still dress something a little above hobo. <laughs> yeah, you um, have that artsy look. I call it the artsy look. Like <laughs> the, I like that. Um, a, part of my life has been film education. And I would be glad to uh, leave Emily with a couple of uh, links and organizations that help uh, support the film education I do. I have a couple of projects out there, introduction to creating a, a digital video that's being used in junior high schools and high schools. And Emily, I'll leave that with you because I know quite a few of your, your audience uh, very likely might be teachers. Now, if uh, I have a four minute film before we get to the question. Can I show it? I'm fine with that. Um, and then we, okay. have, we have a couple of questions. So yeah, we'll do that. And I'm okay. happy to facilitate, like you said, we do have a couple of teachers showing this to their classrooms, so. so okay. That's okay. Okay. And this was a, a, a student a generated film. A student of mine back at Kapiling Community College found this uh, little guy who was kind of overlooked. And we decided he, he's got something in his heart and soul. And when we went further, you'll see what we did. Okay, do I need to hit share screen or just play? Yes, share, score, share screen, yeah. Well, that's starting. I wanted to mention Film Natchez is about to uh, announce a lot of online education workshops for filmmakers, so more coming yes. soon. Yes. Okay. See, I, I got him down here, the, right here. Can you see that? No. No. Okay, here it comes. Now hit, yeah, now open it. Hmm. Is it, is it not working on your end, Mark? Let me, let me just do one more quick thing here. We can see your screen. So if, if you pull it up on your screen, we're gonna be able to see it. Let's try that. You may have shared only that screen and not 
the video that's opening up. Okay, it shows that I'm sh sharing. Mark, if it's playing, stop sharing and then reshare and share what is playing. Yeah, I'm sorry. The video doesn't seem to be picking up on it. Well, maybe we just, uh, because of time, take the yeah. two questions. And then if anyone is, you know, interested in, yeah. in that video, I can facilitate that, them getting in touch with you. And what I'll do is I'll share the link, uh, uh, the YouTube link for that. How's that? That sounds good. Um, hey, you want to go to the questions? Yes, we'll go to the questions. Let me pull that. Okay. First, we have one that's for Melanie. So I'll ask that before we get to more group questions. Um, Melanie, what challenges and advantages have you faced as a female documentary maker? Um, hmm. You know, I don't do it full time since I run a film festival. So I feel like I don't have the best answer. Um, I think that I, I learned, I started early before a lot of female filmmakers were out there. The past 10 years have really changed. Um, and so a lot of times early on, unless it was a crew I built personally and really trusted <laughs> and knew me, um, that the male crew members would ask like my DP because he was male rather than me directly. Um, that's really changed. That's like old days. Um, but in general, I mean, there are some additional funding resources, but at the same time, it's harder to get funding as a female filmmaker. Um, but there's been positives too. There's one thing I built at my festival because it really helped me was to connect with other, other female filmmakers. And so we have like a female filmmaker retreat and stuff like that. So just learning the problems I had and the obstacles and trying to, as a gatekeeper myself, break those barriers for others. Um, and I think even now it's, it's easier than it was five years ago to make a film. So I don't know, there's, it's the same challenge as any other filmmaker has, really, is the answer. Gotcha. Um, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna jump in here and give a plug uh, to Melanie. Uh, uh, film festivals are an extraordinary way for anyone, whether you're a beginner, intermediate, whether you're a pro, to go and interact with these filmmakers and ask them questions. They love the, the camaraderie in a film festival. And Melanie, you, you do great film festivals. I, I've been to several. And just, you can Google film festivals in whatever state you're in, Mississippi film festivals, Louisiana film festivals, and they'll pop up. And some of them are quite reasonable to attend. Go, you'll love it. You'll come back and you'll want to grab a camera and start shooting. Yeah, I mean, our virtual fest this year, we're selling the, the passes for $35 because we don't want economic issues to be a barrier to access um but you know some festivals are like five hundred dollars but there's a lot of free workshops and panels at almost any festival level in fact sundance is about to release all their um panels for free on their podcast so you don't have to have gone to sundance without you can get that knowledge mm -hmm. great advice we do have a ninth grade english class watching um and the question from that class is, what writing skills do you use most in your job? So whoever wants to start that. Um, I was a journalist first. I worked for the Oxford Eagle. Uh, and then I worked for this ninth grade class. You might be interested in Oxford, Mississippi. There's a pizza magazine, which is really fun to work for. Um, and then I did social media direction. So I learned more marketing writing uh, for this job, but I think documentary and journalism are so intertwined that you use a lot of those skills. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll jump in. Uh, writing skills are very important. Uh, if you're writing a script that goes along with your film, if you're writing narration that you want someone to say, if you're writing text like titles and other parts of your film, then you really need to have good writing skills if you're going to apply for a grant. 
Or you hire did. somebody to copy edit you so you don't misspell people's names. Since right. They so, yes. Very little money. Uh, writing skills are important. I'll let the other uh, folks jump in and uh, expand on that. Well, I, I, I'm going to be um, a little quick here. Um, since we're talking to an English class, <laughs> 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 uh, I'm going to say this. Um, I used to be like everyone in this class. And I'm sure there's many of you in this class of wondering, what are you doing in English? Why do you have to do this work? You know, it's not a fun place to be. I'm gonna tell you, I wasn't the perfect English um, student, but I did listen. And I listened to how to tell stories and so on. You know, let's be simple. The beginning, middle, and the end. I've learned that pattern of make, you know, telling stories, of course. Many of us have, um, but it's interesting because I never once thought that I would be using it, you know, as a tool of life, you know, as I won't say a job, but use it with my passion. And so I have become a writer because of it, you know, and it's just interesting about the way life is that you grow up and you think there are certain things in your life that is not important for you at this moment in time, or you're looking at English saying, why do I need this? What am I going to do with this? It, it seeps up on you. And that's what happened to me. And so it's funny. It's, it's just funny that this is an English course, an English class that is, has tuned in um, to learn about filmmaking because writing is very important um, in filmmaking. And this is something that you're going to use um, so often. Um, maybe it's not even telling the story, as, as Mark and, and Melanie said, writing grants, um, writing concepts, because I have to write concepts for television. And these are different disciplines that you'll learn along the way. I'm a screenwriter as well. And so it's a whole different discipline than using, uh, you know, this kind of format for writing documentaries and so on. It's different formats and, and disciplines. So it's something fun that you're going to learn along the way. And I would, I would add two things. I was an English major. Sorry, I'm echoing. Um, and I had a quote on my desk through all of college that just said, find your voice. And that's something that I think about all the time, even now uh, in telling a documentary story, but also just really um, taking a speech class because you end up using that a lot more than you're gonna realize. James? Yeah, uh, so certainly I echo English is important, absolutely. And I will, I will share with you that there are two things that will kill a documentary. One is bad sound. If you're not wired up for sound. And two, if you have to, if you're even, even you're going to be responsible for captioning uh, that. And so, oh, it says my internet connection is unstable. Uh, can you still hear me? Okay. So, like, like for example, my films, I send them off to a company to be captioned and then, but it's my responsibility to get it, when I get it back, that what what is said on the screen matches what is, is trailing across the bottom. So knowing the English language is hugely important just for that skill alone. So a yes to the English class, yes, it's important. English is very important. Great, thank you all so much. Um, we, I definitely want to get that information from you, Mark, because we do have people that are requesting some of that. And any of you that think you have um, links or resources that would be good for some of these students, if you'll email them to me, I'll compose that and get that out to them. Um, we do have one final question. I'm going to ask James because it's talking about you talking about uh, DVD demand. Um, we're going to do this really quick and then we're going to wrap up. Um, but I think it's a good question. What are the challenges of distribution do you have in the age of Netflix, Amazon, broadcast internet, and that sort of thing? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, so I, when I go to a lot of festivals or, and, and not so much film festivals, um, but also public venues, is I always have DVDs ready to go to sell. People want that. Sometimes they want me to sign it and they just want to say, oh, I, you know, I saw that film. Um, but you know what I'm finding out is that you got to be careful with these big streaming services because like, for example, Netflix, they'll, they'll take the whole thing from you and you may not ever get it back. 
And so you want to keep that creative control of your film. Uh, the 6888 has been, is in the process now of being uh, optioned into a, either a feature film or a TV series. And had we gone with the first group out of Hollywood, we would not, we wouldn't have retained anything. They just wanted to buy it from us and have us go away. So we told them, no, you go away. Uh, and the, the second group, uh, they're a real good group. I don't know if folks heard of the actor Aldous Hodge. Um, yeah, so that's who I'm partnering with to get the 6888 made. And, and he's a rising star, and so we think it's going to get done. But, but um, yeah, I, I think make sure that you, you always watch your control of, the, of your film. You know, don't let it, don't let it get into someone else's hands. And then, uh, and then, and then on your website, always have, you know, be prepared to make sales there too. So um, I think that's the biggest thing I want folks to know is control your product. Good advice. Thank you. Well, um, y'all, I appreciate this so much. I feel like we could go on and on and on. Um, <laughs> so hopefully we'll get to do this again sometime, maybe in person in Natchez. That would be great. Um, but Mark, James, Melanie, Keith, thank you so much. And, thank you. Uh, thank yeah, thank you. you. And I do want to encourage everyone to continue watching throughout the week for the NLCC and to fill out the survey. I'll post one in the comments and it'll be circulating throughout. So thanks, everybody. <laughs>